very closely uh, attentive to the proceedings, going back and forth between Blanche and Michael Cohen. Another thing that struck me, ladies, when the jury walks in, they walk right by Donald Trump. They walk right by the table he's sitting. None of them look at him. The second they get in front of him, right in his line of sight, they all look down, each one of them, one after the other. They make a point not to look at him as if there's something almost, and I'm, I, I'm not them, so I can't you know, accurately say what they're feeling with any um, exact knowledge, but it almost seems like there's a certain intimidation quality just walking by uh, the former president of the United States. In terms of the atmospherics of the room beyond Blanche, beyond Cohen, um, Donald Trump walks in with all the normal swagger that Donald Trump always has. You've seen it and you can imagine it accurately because we all know him so well at this point. He also walks in with quite a big entourage. Today it was Lauren Boebert, it was Matt Gates, Boris Epstein is always there. And there was something of a, I mean, it felt to me like a mean girl quality to their presence. They walk in stoic, stone faced, but when they sat down, they looked around the room, they noticed George Conway, they started to snicker, everybody turned and they stared right at George Conway and then whispered among themselves. They did the sort of the same thing looking at Michael Cohen. You get the idea that Donald Trump bringing this crowd with him is not just a show of force for the cameras outside, but it's a show of force for the witness inside and potentially even the jury. Can you get under Michael Cohen's skin by not just showing him Donald Trump sitting at the defense stand, but all of his entourage with him, the lawmakers who have yelled at him in Congress, uh, the potential VP candidates, uh, Donald Trump's own family, former colleagues of his, Boris Epstein there, trying to see if, if anybody could knock him off his game. Michael Cohen, for his part, has not looked over at Donald Trump from what I can tell. Um, he has stayed very focused. If he had gotten any coaching, um, and I know he's gotten a lot, about how to deal with, with Todd Blanche, um, he's doing it. I mean, he, he doesn't seem like he's somebody who isn't aware of the way that he should approach this testimony, isn't aware of um, how he should say yes. There were a couple instances. Be people screaming. It might not be people who are sitting in the courtroom who suddenly have a collective gasp because of what they just heard. Was there any moment at all in what you've heard and you've been sitting there all morning? No, no, I haven't heard anything like that. But I don't think you're going to get that from this case. I haven't seen, I haven't seen any uh, interaction with the lawyers, uh, with Michael Cohen, the lawyers between each other. Even the objections are quiet. You know, the judge is quiet. It's a very, very calm room. Yeah, you could argue it's tense, but it is very calm. And if there's going to be, a, you know, a John Grisham knockout punch. I don't know if it's going to be so apparent. Um, at least it hasn't been to me so far. And again, I've only been here uh, for a few hours today. And Katie, you know, you say you're not a lawyer, but you know Donald Trump so well and all these players so well. And just the atmospherics, as you describe them. Danny Savalas was just sharing with us that as a defense lawyer, he felt that, the, that Todd Blanche was going over and over it too much, that you don't have to throw everything in and follow every thread. And one of the threads that he's been following is, you know, didn't you tell your daughter that you thought you could be attorney general or White House chief of staff or this job or that job? And it seemed to me <laughs> that going into his texts with his daughter, those confidential texts, might make some jurors uncomfortable, that that was, you know, too much, it, because he's already established that he was, you know, not telling the truth when he said he didn't want a job in the White House. But at one point, he's also saying, no, I didn't, I didn't want to be the deputy counsel, White House counsel. I wanted to be personal lawyer to the president, which is the job that he eventually did get, as you pointed out. So it seems as though that may be overkill. It, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell how the jury is taking it. And yeah. again, they're paying attention. I've seen some, you know, very minor reaction, mostly, you know, when that podcast was playing or names uh, that Michael Cohen has called Donald Trump are brought up. But other than that, there hasn't been a lot of reaction, visible reaction uh, from the jury. A lot of them are taking notes. They are paying close attention. And I, you know, I've, I've had enough conversations now with Andrew Weissman and Lisa Rubin and Danny Savalos and all of our uh, fantastic legal analysts to know that they will say that it's hard to predict how a jury, sure. which way a jury is going to go. They will at times uh, point out one juror and, you know, there are people in the room pointing out individual jurors saying, I think that person is X or that person is Y. 
and often uh, they're they're proven wrong by what happens in deliberations. So again, I mean, it's just it's hard to tell. But as somebody who who is steeped in this case personally, um, I've done a you know a lot of reading about it. I've done a lot of studying about it. I obviously cover it with you ladies every single day. I was there. Uh, covering the campaign during the period that is at the core of this case. I know I know the details of what was happening at the time. The, a lot of these arguments can be hard for me to follow, so I'm, I, I'm just not clear uh, what the jury is getting out of the, the minutia of what Todd Blanche is trying to argue, other than just really emphasizing that Michael Cohen is a man who was out for himself. Michael Cohen is a man who he's, Todd Blanche is arguing, um, cannot be trusted, who lies, and when he's caught doing something wrong, tries to shift the blame. And this time, he's shifting the blame to Donald Trump because Donald Trump didn't do right by him, didn't, in this argument that you're hearing um, right now, didn't take right. him to the White House. And didn't give him a bonus. So, well, Katie, come on back. Yeah. Uh, we got to, the we'll chair is right here for you. We really want to see you, but it's great insights to have you in the podium. Thank I've, you packed a peanut butter and jelly sandwich uh chris jansing so I, I i took your i took your i heated your good deed the other day and i i have some sustenance i'm gonna go back in just for a couple minutes but then okay. i'll see you guys up there also by the way your terrific piece that you wrote for the new york times because you talked about the connection between michael cohen and the jurors how he's looking at them how they were paying close attention to him obviously this was not written today this was written based on your earlier observations but i'm wondering about todd blanche because even though you can't read the minds of jurors you know when a lawyer is connecting in my limited experience you know when a witness is connecting you know when they're paying close attention What's your thought today, and particularly about Todd Blanche and the way the jury is observing him? Well, I think the color that Katie Turk gave is exactly my impression as well. And there was, a, I agree, the striking moment when you heard the voice of Michael Cohen on his podcast, which was distinctly different than the in-court Michael Cohen. That doesn't mean Michael Cohen is lying on the stand, but it is useful for the jury to see that that is not what he's, he's not always in the mode that he's in in the courtroom. Um, for the every day that he's been on, whether it's on direct or cross, he is unflappable, even on cross-examination that mentions his wife and, as Andrea just pointed out, cross-examination with texts with his daughter, which I personally think is playing poorly. Um, the cross there is about essentially the daughter thinking how great he is and how he deserves so much. And, um, you know, that's sort of what you would want your child to be thinking. So I, I'm not sure that was the right decision. Um, Todd Blanche is, is obviously doing better than uh, the last time we saw him, but that's a very low bar. He, as to Danny's point, his sort of technique is is you know, as a professional in the area, his technique needs some work. Um, and that's why you're hearing Katie Chur say, I'm not sure I totally follow what he's getting at and how this is supposed to land. And that is actually because of the techniques that Todd Blanche is using. I but wonder if it would land the, the better if, from his perspective. If Andrew, it would land better if they were a little tighter, because he's still talking about him not getting the job that he believes he wanted, chief of staff. Going back into the document, Todd Blanche, do you recall expressing dip disappointment to Pastor Scott that Trump right. hadn't brought you into the administration? I may have expressed frustration, but I don't recall. Did you have communication with Pastor Scott about your frustration that President Trump did not bring you to the White House? I don't recall. Did you have communication with Pastor Scott even after Trump took office about the fact that you weren't working at the White House? I don't recall that. Do you recall on National Prayer Day expressing frustration that you were in the office and not at the White House with everyone else, that I wasn't invited? Yes, sir. Do you recall talking to Pastor Scott about that? What do you recall saying to him? That it would have been nice to be invited. Again, this is yet the latest in a string of people, Reince Priebus among others, that he's trying to show, here's a guy who's really unhappy about not working in the White House, does it need to continue to go on and on with every person he might have expressed that to? Well, I think that what you were seeing is the defense trying to figure out what they're going to argue in summation. And 
It looks uh, like what they're going to say is because he was only the president's personal attorney, that he was so angry with President Trump for not being brought to Washington, just being his personal attorney, that he's concocted this whole story, a story which the, the state will argue just happens to have a mountain of corroboration. So, look, they have to come up with something. Um, I think most lawyers might say being the president's personal attorney is pretty darn good. Um, so it's hard to see that as a, as a particularly compelling motive. Um, but you do have something that is a foolproof line of cross that Todd Blanche, I think, did deliver on, um, as he should, which is that Michael Cohen has committed perjury. He has lied under oath. He has admitted that he lied to a federal judge. Um, he has you know, said that sort of repeatedly. Um, and they want to say that, you know, when it's in his personal interest, he's willing to lie and say now it's in his personal interest to see Donald Trump go down because he's making money off of it. So he's just saying this lie because he both is a disgruntled former employee and because he gets to make money off it. So you shouldn't believe him. That's that is. Um, the line of cross. By the way, welcome to New York City, <laughs> where there's lots and lots of traffic and police activity. Um, Can I just say you're doing rumors, remarkably well for not down. being a professional correspondent? <laughs> Kudos to you. Sorry, continue. Well, sure. Um, I did want to point out a couple things that um, I thought really fell flat, um, and something I know personally is they tried to say Michael Cohen got a lower sentence um, for his crimes in spite of his not cooperating fully. And, you know, the, I know he actually did cooperate with the special counsel Mueller investigation, and that was said by our prosecutors. So this is just a quick update to sort of dispel some of the things you might have been hearing. There is an argument out there that Michael Cohen has struggled in the final portions, the latest portions at least, of his cross-examination. But the reality is, is that it's left people confused more than anything. And not necessarily his answers confusing people, but the continued confusing line of questioning in addition to the massive distraction brought by the Republican crony showing it up showing up and making it not about justice but all about them and who can bend over backwards forwards however as much as they can for the orange monster that's the real story here that they are a big distraction on a day that's supposed to be about justice. And while, of course, that distraction is not going to be maximized inside the courtroom because the real insanity is happening outside, a lot of that noise is going to travel through the hallways and just them being in the room, the jury's going to notice that. Some of these jurors are going to know who Bobert Gates and all these MAGA freaks are. And mark my words... That's going to be the story today. So Cohen's already landed some knockout blows earlier. And even if today wasn't perfect, Trump's team has failed to seize the moment. And they've gotten booted out of the court as the judge is furious with the circus in the process.